Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it's still really exciting to see people in person and have this live audience. So thank you for being here. <laughs> And then thank you also to all of our folks who are here on our live stream. We have a really robust RSVPs, both for here in person and also for online connecting from all around the world. So that's been a really exciting project for us here at Janum, and we're excited to share that with UCSC tonight as well. Um, my name is Joy Yamaguchi. I'm the public program supervisor here. Oh, thank you, Lucy. <laughs> at the Japanese American National Museum. Um, so thank you so much um, on behalf of the museum, and you'll be hearing more from us in a moment as well. Um, but I'm here to do the, all the fun housekeeping. Um, so just want to remind you that masks are required for all unvaccinated visitors and encouraged for all. Um, restrooms are available up on the second floor and they're accessible by the stairs here or the elevator in the lobby. Um, please note also the illuminated emergency exits all around. Um, they may not be the one that you entered in. Um, and in case of emergency, please exit through the doors and do not take the elevator. Um, and then we ask also that you don't eat or drink inside the forum um, to keep our space clean for all. And also note this program is being live streamed and recorded for future, um, future sharing. Um, and we will have a Q&A at the end in which you'll be encouraged to text your um, questions to a, a phone number so that we can share them with our moderator. So we'll be sharing that number up on the screen um, during the Q&A. So with that, um, I want to say thank you so much again, and um, please enjoy. I hope that some of you got a chance to visit the galleries or get a chance to come back later um, and visit the museum again. But um, I'm going to now introduce the president and CEO of the Japanese American National Museum, Ann Burroughs, um, to share some more. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Gosh, it is so wonderful to see so many people under this roof, under one roof. And it's so wonderful to think that we have as many people as we do who are watching us and who've, who've joined us from, from all over the world. Um, it's a real joy. It's a real joy to welcome you all here to celebrate the extraordinary Karen Te Yamashita, who has had such... <laughs> such an amazing, such an amazing career. It's only a career that many of us can, we could never emulate, we can only dream of. So it's a real honor for us to be able to have Karen in the house. And it's so wonderful that all of you could be here with us to celebrate her. Um, I know I see some familiar faces in the audience. But I'm sure, and certainly online, we have, you know, we have people who have never been to Janum. I know that some of you have just been given a tour of, of our exhibitions in the museum. But I thought for those of you who weren't on the tour and those of you who aren't familiar with, with the museum and certainly those who are online who are not familiar with Janum, I thought I would spend just a couple of minutes telling you about the significance of the museum and the significance of the place where we find ourselves. So Janum, we're in our 30th anniversary this year. Janum was founded 30 years ago. And the vision of our founders was that the memory, the history of what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II should never be forgotten. And it should never be forgotten so that what happened to them never happened to anybody else. So what we do at Janum is to preserve that history, we preserve those stories, we preserve those artifacts, and importantly, we preserve those memories. And the reason we do that is because it must never happen to anybody else. And we also know that what happened, the impetus, the context, that drove the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans during the Second World War, that context of prejudice, that context of racism, that context of discrimination, and that context of othering is as present as it was then, which makes our mission all the more relevant and makes our mission all the more important. It's also no accident that Janum was founded on this place, on this plaza where we are now, because this was the place where many of the Japanese Americans who lived in Los Angeles 
came, they were forced to board the buses here that would take them on the first leg of their journey to wherever they were held for the duration of the war. So for me, this is one of those extraordinarily powerful places in the history of civil rights in this country. To me, it's one of those ground zero places. And it's also really important that we have this space here where we can gather people to come together to talk about race, to talk about justice, to talk about equality. But really, and I, you know, which is so extraordinary, we're so excited to have Karen here because this is also where we talk about memory. And we talk about what memory means. And we talk about memory is not just in the remembering, but memory is as much about remembering as it is about justice. And certainly for this community and communities all over the country, that justice, that memory is based in restorative justice. So I am my own, my own background. I was a pol political prisoner in South Africa. Um, I was involved in, in the anti-apartheid struggle. I was involved in the formation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I understand the importance of that memory. I understand what the consequences are when that memory is, is forgotten. So it's just enormously moving for me to have all of you here and to be able to talk about these important things and also to be able to have Karen talk to us about her extraordinary work. So. It's with really great pleasure now that I, that I bring up, oh, I lost you on my, Jasmine Allender, who is the Dean of Humanities of the University of California, Santa Cruz. She received her PhD in the history of art from the University of Michigan. She's an interdisciplinary, community-engaged scholar and teacher of public history, the history of photography and the history of Japanese Americans during World War II. The overarching themes that unite her work are human rights and civil liberties, with a focus on the United States from the 1940s to the, to the present. So Jasmine, please come up and be welcome. We couldn't be happier to have you, and we couldn't be happier to have this partnership with UC Santa Cruz. Thank you, Anne. You know you're really important when it takes four people to introduce you and get you up on the stage. So in just a few minutes, um, we will hear from Karen. I am grateful to be here. It is an honor um, for me to be Dean of Humanities at UC Santa Cruz. And I am delighted to partner with the Japanese American National Museum for this gathering. I want to extend my gratitude to everyone at JANUM and at UCSC for making this event possible. Kristen Hayashi, Joy Yamaguchi, Colleen Uchida Tammy, Carrie Napolis, Mickey Arlen, Nikki Torres. And I'm happy to see so many other banana slugs in the audience this evening, including our new Dean of the Arts, Celine Prinius Shimizu. I also um, want to take a moment to acknowledge what the Japanese American National Museum has meant to me personally and the role it's played in my own development as a scholar. I first came to this museum many years ago in the mid-1990s. I was a graduate student then working on the history of photography and Japanese American incarceration. And I have learned tremendously from this museum, from the exhibitions, the archives, and from events like this one we have today. I've learned from the people who made this place possible, members of the staff, docents, curators, and as I stand here now, I, I think of the kindness, of the intelligence, of the wisdom of people who are no longer with us, Babe Karasawa, Karen Higa. I remember touring the Sight Unseen exhibition with Masumi Hayashi and walking with Archie Miyataki along First Street pausing before the sculpture of his father's camera outside of the historic former Buddhist temple. A highlight of my career was giving a talk on my own research on this very stage. So I'm very grateful for what I've learned in this place and I look forward to learning more with you all this evening. The museum's underlying purpose is to transform lives, create a more just America, and ultimately a better world. It certainly has transformed my life and serves as a model for the transformative power I believe the humanities can have. In the humanities at UCSC, we study the world as it has been. 
We critique the world as it is, and we imagine and create the engaged, inclusive democracy we aspire to be. Karen Tiyamashita brought tremendous energy, laughter, and a passionate commitment to social justice to creative writing at UCSC, and we continue to follow in her footsteps. So I would like to now introduce you to Alice Yang, my colleague who will introduce our speaker. <laughs> That's right. Professor Yang is a historian who co-directs the Center for the Study of Pacific War Memories. She received her PhD in history from Stanford and has been a member of the faculty at UCSC since 1993. Her publications include Historical Memories of the Japanese American Internment and the Struggle for Redress, and What Did the Internment of Japanese Americans Mean? Winner of the University's Excellence in Teaching Award, she teaches courses on historical memory, World War II, and Asian American history, and is currently completing a book on the role of Japanese American women in challenging the injustice of the World War II mass incarceration, fighting for redress, and joining current anti-racist and social justice campaigns. Professor Ying. new ritual. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Allender. Karen Te Yamashita is a professor emerita of literature and creative writing at UC Santa Cruz, where our motto is fiat lux, which in Latin means let there be light. This makes Santa Cruz an especially appropriate home for Karen because any quick Google search will reveal why, why she is a luminary and leading voice in American literature and culture. She is the author of eight incredible books, Through the Arc of the Rainforest, Brazil Maru, Tropic of Orange, Circle K Cycles, I Hotel, Anime Wong, Letters to Memory, and Sanse and Sensibility. Yeah. Yes. And they're all page turners. Even I Hotel, which is a massive book, but many of my students say that even then they can't put it down. Karen has also won just about every possible prize in her field, including a Rockefeller Playwright in Residence Fellowship, a John Dos Passos Prize for Literature, a US Artists Ford Foundation Fellowship, a California Book Award, an Asian Pacific American Librarians Association Award, multiple Association for Asian American Studies book awards, and a UC Presidential Chair in Feminist Critical Race and Ethnic Studies. And most recently, she received a 2021 Medal for Distinguished Contributions to American Letters from the National Book Foundation. An award she shares with such other luminaries as Toni Morrison, Isabel Allende, Joan Didion, and Maxine Hong Kingston. David Steinberger, the chair of the board of directors of the National Book Foundation, celebrated Karen as, quote, a bold and groundbreaking writer whose creative body of work has made an enduring impact on our literary landscape whether it's an evocative exploration of cities, collaborative performance productions, or connecting the plots of Jane Austen to Japanese American life, her work reaches across time, country, and culture to offer readers a powerfully complex guide to our world. But Karen is much more than just an internationally acclaimed author. And I urge you to listen to her acceptance speech for the National Book Foundation Award, which is available on YouTube, because you will get a sense of why, unlike some other famous and brilliant authors who can be arrogant, intimidating, or unapproachable, Karen exudes compassion, modesty, and a fervent commitment to using her talent to forge a society of tolerance and care, especially in the wake of the structural inequality most recently exposed by the pandemic, the brutality of racial profiling, Black Lives Matter demonstrations, and the spread of anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, anti-Muslim, and anti-Asian hatred. 
If, like me, you were lucky enough to count KT, as we call her, as a friend, you'll know that she is also a luminary because she literally envelops any room she is in with her warmth, kindness, wit, and humor. Some of this I attribute to her upbringing because I had the honor of getting to know her mother, Asako, who passed on to KT her cooking skills, her friendliness, and her enthusiasm for learning. No, is that, you didn't get the cooking skills from Asako? I thought I've had food. Okay, sorry about that. Um, you must have made the food that I thought Asako made. Um, that, and her enthusiasm for learning that led her to sit in with Karen on some of my classes. Normally, having another professor, much less a famous author, would make me nervous in the classroom. But as I saw the two of them in the front row, listening intently, eager, and clearly engaged, they made me even more excited about the material I was teaching. If Asako helped shape KT, KT and Ronaldo also passed on her kindness to her son, John. I lived around the corner from KT for several years, and I would frequently see out my window how John became the Pied Piper of the neighborhood, leading a group of kids of all ages onto the grassy field to teach them soccer, to play games, to help them even when they stumbled and, and would fall. John's son, Milton, who I think is here, is he here? Um, and my youngest son, Michael, played together when they were young. And to this day, KT is one of my only friends who he, whose name he remembers. <laughs> Not, mind you, because of her fame as an author, or even because she's the grandmother of Milton. The reason why Michael remembers her name is because for the last year of my dad's life, KT showed her support and love by bringing us food and many tasty desserts. I don't know if I told you this, but the flan that she made for us was relished by my dad at a time when he could barely swallow and, was, and provided one of the last experiences of joy he had before he passed. So for Michael, KT will always be the friend who bakes cakes. <laughs> and for me, she is a luminary because she's the friend I know I can always count on when I need help or just when I need someone to make me smile and laugh. But for all of you and for all of us, she will always be, as well, the acclaimed author whose books shine a light on how we can treat each other with kindness, and work together to make our communities and the entire world more just and more humane. It is my extreme honor to introduce KT or Karen Te Yamashita. Shorter than all these ladies. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. Thank you, Ann Burroughs. Thank you, Carrie. Kari, Carrie, Carrie Napoli. Where are you? Somewhere. Okay, hi. Um, thank you to UC Santa Cruz and to um, Janum, the Japanese American National Museum. I'm, I'm so honored. Thank you. Um, and thank you, all of you who are here tonight. It's been a long time. Yeah. And, and so my sister said, you've got to have a shout out to all the OG friends here tonight. <laughs> so I thought I'd, I'd start with that. I know there's someone here who was at Sixth Avenue Elementary School. Shout out. I know. Where are you? Stuart. Ah. Ah, okay. Yeah, and um, how about Coliseum Elementary School? Woohoo! Yeah. Audubon Junior High School. Woohoo! Uh, Dorsey on the West Side. Hey. 
Gardena High School. Woohoo! Yeah. How about Centenary Joy Bells? Someone know? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, here's one Carl's in College. Yay! <laughs> and um, since I taught one semester at USC, USC. And I tried to get a job at UCLA, but they gave it to Renee Tajima Benya at UCLA. <laughs> Anybody here, Waseda? Maybe, maybe, Waseda? Okay, okay, forget it. Um, and finally, uh, UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> thank you, thank you for welcoming me home. Um, I'm going to read three pieces, and they are all related to the idea of the museum um, and archiving of art and memory. Let's see. So this first piece was a reflection that I wrote um, for Sutra and Bible, the exhibit here at Janum now. Um, and it was done at the behest of Duncan Rukin Williams, who is curator, or one of the curators for that show. Um, and uh, thank you for that. Is Duncan here? No? Okay, thank you, thank you so much. So I'm gonna read f that piece. In the last year of her life, my mother Asako spoke more openly of the trauma of the war years and her incarceration at Topaz. She remembered how few people came to their aid to protest that injustice. We were so alone, she said, except for the Quakers. And there was also the Fellowship of Reconciliation. I thought about this, about how a group of people under a spiritual and moral banner might come forward in a time of war hysteria, risking personal safety to act against the fury of public hatred political manipulation, and unjust laws. What moral compass directs individuals to care beyond themselves for others? Was it in the case of the Quakers and the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the FOR, their pacifism? In the story of war, what is pacifism and who is the pacifist? The deeper American history of these institutions is Christian and abolitionist. Equal regard for all human life, connecting to the philosophy of Henry David Thoreau, the right to civil protest and nonviolent direct action, pacifism, not passive denial, but an active choice of conscience to arm oneself against an enemy, not with the gun, but with the mind and the body. I discovered in our family archive of correspondence and documents that our Aunt Kay, Yamashita, was the pivot that connected our family to outside friendships with folks of conscience and kindness. Among seven family siblings, the youngest sister Kay was an unlikely pivot. In 1942, a recent graduate of Cal Berkeley, a kid sister, naive and idealistic. But by odd circumstances, when the entire population of Japanese Americans in San Francisco, Bay Area, were imprisoned at Tamferan, on July 4th, 1942, she was the lone Oriental at a conference organized at Mills College by Caleb Foote of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. At this 10-day conference, convened to discuss, among many topics, Japanese American removal, Kay would meet among many influential progressive folks, African-American pas pastor Howard Thurman, and Quakers Tom Bodine and uh, Joe Connard. And in the following months, she also met and lived for a short time in Hidden Villa, ranch and home of Quakers Josephine and Frank Duvenek. The resonances of these connections are significant Caleb Foote would go on to protest the racist injustice of Japanese American imprisonment, writing what is an astute legal dissent, with photographs by Dorothea Lang in the pamphlet Outcasts. 
At the behest of FOR leader A.J. Musty, Howard Thurman and Alfred Fisk would found the multiracial church for the Fellowship of All Peoples on Post Street in the empty neighborhood of San Francisco, Nihon Machi, Japantown. And Quakers Tom Bodine and Joe Kennard, with the help of the Duvenics, will organize the National Japanese American Student Relocation Council to help some 4,600 incarcerated students pursue higher education in over 600 institutions across the country. It could not be known then, but each of these actions held help, hope for the future. Kay rejoined her in-prison family at Tanferand and Topaz, but was finally granted leave to work in Philadelphia, eventual headquarters for the Quaker project of Nisei student relocation, under the leadership of John Nason. Thus Kay became an engaged and meaningful Thus, Kay became engaged in meaningful work inspired by Quaker and FOR friends. In these war years, Kay and fellow staff workers communicated in hundreds of letters back and forth with young Nisei students, working for their release from camps to secure placement in colleges and universities across the country. She also wrote to support, commiserate, cajole, and advise young people who'd left their families behind in prison camps to face a world of distrust and racial prejudice. The practice of pacifism, of peacemaking, in what were the darkest times for Japanese Americans was a gift of courage and light, upholding the right to protest, to seek justice, and to face the future. Okay, this is a second piece, and I'll just read the beginning of it and it will be part of a catalog um, for an upcoming show called Be Here. Um, the media artist from Japan, Masahaki, Masa, Masaki Fujihata, is curating this. And um, also Michael Emmerich at UCLA, um, professor, I think he's, is he chair of Asian Studies? He invited me to write this piece. And uh, it's called Yuki's Rashomon. So I'm going to read uh, the short beginning. The child. One day in the future, I become. But in the future, no one would remember this future. We would only remember the past, recorded forever in one spot, globally positioned and timed precisely by a cruel accident of history and the happenstance of photographic capture, the technology of time travel, imprisoned in the virtual eternity of a museum, saved in its infinite brain, attic, cloud, buried alive, but beautiful. Beautiful, because innocent children are beautiful, and everything we hold dear, the tenuousness and fragility of their expectations, seeing beyond and into, hope before we close our eyes each night. And finally, in the photo, I am two. I am enemy and prisoner. In the future, I have no memory of the moment because memory does not begin until later. I say yes. That must be me. And this photo here? In this photo, I am nine. I am survivor and orphan. I remember my baby brother dies. I run from yellow smoke, clothing evaporating, skin burning. I say, yes, that is my naked body. And in this photograph here, in the photo, I am 10. I am refugee and exile. I remember my mother. I can't see myself to remember me. I stare at the machine, pointing like a gun. I could be brave. Maybe I say, that is me. And this photograph here, in the photo, I am 15. 
I am alive. I remember my mother and I bathe together. I say yes, that is my floating body. The inspector nods gravely. We have tests to know the truth. We can look into the iris of your eye and match the iris in the photo. Then we can be sure. You mean, you don't believe me, that, that is me. This photo has historic significance. The child in the photograph can't just be any child. I could be any child, but not necessarily the child, child in this photograph. I am no longer the child in that photograph. This is true. The child blinks. The camera blinks. So I'll stop there. And these are the persons photographed and the photographers. So this is the last excerpt. And it's a chapter from a book in progress. Um, and um, I think it's the first chapter I wrote, although it's in the middle of the book. Um, and it sort of gave me the idea for the rest of the book. Um, I've entitled Isamu, Becoming Nisei. April. Isamu checked into the desert asylum. Out there, the war was ongoing. They said it would be safer inside. Looking as he did like the enemy, he'd avoid hostility, be protected, be together with his own kind. And since he was volunteering to enter, it was an act of loyalty in support of the cause. He wasn't as crazy as the others. There were degrees of crazy. He was on the lower end of that spectrum, functionally superior by contrast and certainly famous enough or let's say, marketable. He brought his work with him. Those were his conditions. Bring in his tools, mach machinery, supplies, set up a workshop studio. Of course, he wasn't asking for special treatment. He'd live just like everyone else. Fair enough. Eventually, he'd build what he required, get the others involved, inspire and train, create a working community. It was like starting from scratch, ground zero starting anew. The desert terrain was a blank slate. Anything was an imag imaginable, but you had to have an imagination. All this was John's idea. They met in San Francisco where John's friend Alfred gave them a personal tour of the museum. Alfred lamented the paucity of space for the current collection, too large for appropriate display but it was their luck that he might take them into the storage behind the scenes, peruse the extensive acquisitions of Egyptian and Peruvian artifacts. He pulled forth a ceramic double jar excavated from a tomb in the Moche Valley and explained, now this is a Chimu pot dating, he looked for the documentation and confirmed, around 1400. The design is clever. Two pots are connected here at the hip like Siamese twins, and this connection serves as a handle. Isamu examined the animal head on one side of the spout and on the other. He could feel the artist's hands there, tools carefully manipulating the once soft clay. He looked at John, whose face was radiant even in the shadows. You can feel it, can't you? John spoke with reverence and as if he knew Isamo's thoughts. Then John urged Alfred to show them the California and Southwest collections. After all, Alfred's specialty, gravitating to tribal life along the Colorado River. As they entered deeper into the museum's bowels, Isamo felt a prick pricking itch at the neck near his left ear, exacerbated by John's excited voice, its suddenly higher pitch. Alfred pried open the cover of a long box and pulling away protective straw and paper exposed a skeleton. We date this maybe at 5,000 years, matching the artifacts in the same archaeological dig. Isamo saw 
John's face strained. His eyes seemed to pierce through the unknown space. At first, he appeared agitated, then serene. The river is a source of life, John intoned. He wandered away, speaking as if in conversation with someone. Isamo caught pieces of the dialogue. Yes, yes, how true. Tell me more. By the way, I'm here with a friend, a, a man with great skills. I'm trying to convince him. If he goes there, he'll take care of him. I'm counting on you. Isamo looked to Alfred for some explanation, but Alfred only blinked and paused, the tour unfazed. He turned to Isamo and said, you didn't know? He hears voices. Whoever they are, they speak in ancient tongues. Believe me, I know. John believes the voices speak great wisdom. Who's to say? John returned still in animated conversation, but in a language Isamo, who spoke also Japanese and French, could not discern. At this point, Alfred translated, look for mesquite, beans to eat, hard wood, medicine box, medicine bark. Alfred looked with interest at Isamu. Are you going out there to the desert reservation? You know, he's the Indian commissioner. They tolerate him since he sincerely believes in the work and he's in touch with the elders. At least he thinks so. At that point, Isamo hadn't decided, but the man trying to convince him, and the man trying to convince him was crazy, conversed with voices that seemed to arise from bones. When John surfaced from his parallel world, he said, well, it's settled, they're waiting for you. May. Good thing Toshio arrived before him. Good to be greeted by a familiar face. Not that he knew Toshio that well. They just met last year, but he was Nisei. Isama realized that before Toshio, he'd never known any Nisei. He'd grown up in Japan, then moved to the Midwest, then to New York, then to Paris. No Nisei in those places. With Toshio, he felt a kinship, and he wanted to know what that kinship was or could be. He himself was technically a Nisei, even though their upbringings were completely different. Toshio's folks immigrated at the turn of the century, ran a bathhouse until they could get a place, a piece of land to grow flowers. Toshio seemed to be a dreamer, head stuck in books and a self-taught writer. They could talk about literature, O. Henry, Sherwood Anderson, Chekhov, Gogol. Isamo could have been a writer too. His parents were poets. He mentioned this in passing to Toshio. But he didn't say his father knew Yeats and corresponded with Ezra Pound. Or maybe he did, and Toshio really didn't believe him. It was better to keep things simple for the time being. Every evening, every evening Toshio sauntered over to Block 5 and sat on Isamo's stoop. Sometimes he arrived earlier and accompanied him to the mess hall for dinner. The food was pretty awful, and it was better to have company to forget about it or to complain. Don't eat that, Toshio warned, and good thing he obeyed. Everyone else had the runs the next day. No room at the latrines. Back at the stoop, he poured tea and they talked. Have you heard from the others? He asked Toshio about their group of Nisei artists and writers. Hey, I, I get L Larry's newsletter, newsletter over from Salt Lake. He's fighting the good fight. I'm writing an essay for him. After that, Toshio came back and forth with his essay about democracy and the Nisei. They discussed the topic endlessly. This was an opportunity for the Nisei to create an authentic democracy. Maybe we were imprisoned for a reason, or we can take control of our own reasons. They both got excited. It's our anti-fascist contribution to the war. Generate, gener generate ingenuity and creativity to serve the art of peace. Their plans rose in a great dream cloud above their heads. Toshio would start a literary magazine, and he'd start an art school. Then one day, Toshio slumped onto the stoop. I got this letter. 
Toshio handed it to him. They say they've got to delay publication of my book. Maybe they publish it after this war was over, but who know, knew when that would be? Toshio tossed the letter and walked away. After that, he didn't see him for a few days. He decided to go looking, found him digging around in the dirt, planting a garden. Toshio looked up with a weak smile. After a while, Toshio started up his daily stoop visits again, but it was like that, up and down. Time and again, he would see the sudden shadow pass across Toshio's face. An uncontrollable sadness cloud his eyes, and he knew Toshio's necessary retreat. It was between Toshio's retreats that the kid, Jack, showed up. Jack lived next door, crowded into a barrack with a family of seven. He was maybe 15. Isamo knew he skipped school and hung back. Don't you have any friends, he asked. Nah, I'm no good with friends. Jack started hanging around watching Isamo carve stone or wood or build furniture. It was intrusive to have an audience. He required concentrated solitude. Isamo sat the kid down with a pencil and paper and told him to draw. Draw what? He asked dumbly. Anything, just draw. Turned out he could. Drew Isamo working. This was even more intrusive, but what could he do? This was part of the plan to create artists. Kid wasn't going to school. This could be his schooling. Toshio came around earlier than usual with a worried, excited look. A little boy's gone missing, he announced. He, he just walked away. No fences out there, so who knows where's he's gone, where he's gone. They're out there searching. I thought, maybe, since you have that kayak. They rushed to launch the kayak. Maybe the boy wandered into the irrigation system and onto the river. It was a possibility. Even so, Isamo hoped they wouldn't find him floating. They pushed out into the water, Isamu rowing, Toshio's eyes scanning. They spent the day out there. At some point, they probably stopped searching, lost themselves in the soft ripple of water, horizon of rock-carved hills against the stark blue, cloudless sky. They could have kept rowing and escaped. They talked, like always, about democracy and freedom, about art and literature, about finding meaning in a time like theirs. When they returned, Jack was there waiting. He was sitting on a stone under a mesquite, digging around on the shore and playing with the wet clay, making random statuary. Isama looked over Jack's figures, drying in the sun. He felt the clay and nodded. Hey, I, I bet we could use this. Ever throw a pot? He got excited. Maybe we could produce our own dishes. Chinaware. But Jack asked, did you find the boy? <laughs> so I'll stop there, thanks. <laughs> OK, now what? <laughs> So are we going to sit up here? Okay. Oh, I'm going to stand here. <laughs> what, what am I doing? <laughs> okay. You're coming up here? What? Wow. I, I'll, I'll stand. <laughs> you sit here. Hello. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there we have it. There's the slide. So we have a very fancy setup that you can text your name and question to the number above me, 213-632-6531. It's going to magically appear on my phone, and I'm going to read it. <laughs> to Karen. So please feel free to text your question. If you don't have your phone with you, 
and you're in this audience and you want to ask a question the old-fashioned way by using your voice, that's also a possibility. So while we're waiting, I think, for questions to come in, um, maybe I'll start with a question or two. I, I have to ask, since it came up in Alice's introduction and there was some controversy over who may have taught you how to cook, um, and it reminded me of the middle of Sansei and Sensibility, there's a, a, a list of Sansei recipes. And so I wondered if you would just talk a little bit about food and cooking and what it means to you. So it's my dad. My dad loved to cook. And he, he what was the name of that book? He, he had this book, uh, Cooking Bold and Fearless. And he would cook up that book. And uh, so he was, my mom was, my son who was raised by my mother loved his food. And he said that she had 12 signature dishes. And my sister and I just busted out laughing. <laughs> Which is like, it was this and rice, and this and rice. And this. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I, I think it's because my mother did not like cooking that my father and also my sister and I learned to cook. So yeah. OK, I'm still waiting for questions to come in. Joy, I hope this is the right system. Oh, here we go. OK, because otherwise. How has your relationship to memory as archives shifted over the years as you play with genres and histories? It's coming from Anjali. <laughs> Who's right there? <laughs> shifted. I don't know. I, I'm just learning about it every time. You know, um, you, you, you know that um, I, started, I started that um, Letters to Memory project because of an archive of letters uh, between the folks in the family as they were um, leaving camp. And so my aunt was one of the first to leave camp, my dad as well, and they were always writing back and forth to my, the grandmother and the family uh, in camp. And so we began to collect those letters. And I, it took me a long time to finally read them, but then uh, with the help of my nieces, we put them in order and um, got the story by reading those, um, those letters. So that was the beginning of it. And then m all my cousins started, w well, dumping everything because m my uncles and aunts all died. So I, they thought, oh, just send it to Karen. So I have these boxes and boxes in the house. I just didn't want to open them. But there were boxes of photographs, more letters, all kinds of um, uh, memorabilia. There were documents from the war, and they, knew it was important, so they had saved all this stuff. And that's when I realized I had to do something with the material. Are some of those documents in the collection at the library at UCSC? They're all there, you know, because um, there was a moment at which my sister said, oh, this is great. We're going to give it away to special collections at McHenry as <laughs> we can get it out of our houses. and. Uh, but it is a treasure trove, and, and, uh, and I based all my writing on that. But there's so much more there. There is, and I, I was there yesterday, actually, and saw some of the boxes out that are being processed right now. I can't wait to take a look at them. OK, from Miriam, how did you start incorporating multiculturalism into your work? Okay, so when I was living here in, in LA, I always thought, well, I, I shouldn't, you know, tamper, I shouldn't bust into other people's cultures. But, you know, I became Harvard, and Har it's hard to write a novel and not talk about other people, right? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> uh, and so the book I wrote about LA was called Tropic of Orange, and I had, the characters are, um, you know, multiracial. 
Um, but they are kind, they were off, actually friends, I guess, in some way. I, though the characters are caricatures, but they're based on people I know or knew and uh, stories. Um, so I started there. Um, and then when I wrote about um, the, the Asian American movement uh, and, and, and wrote for the I Hotel, I realized that I, I really did have to bust in and, and, and write about the Filipinos in that movement. It's, it's, they're very important to the uh, story of the I Hotel, Chinatown, uh, Japantown. Um, so I spent hours and hours just talking to people and reading everything. And also, I, I did my homework. I, in fact, I did too much. So I almost never finished that book. From Marsha Wakasa, where does the inspiration for your books come from? Family history, personal experiences? Well, oh, okay. Well, there's there's a question I'll have, and so I started writing when I was in Brazil, um, and the research I did there was to research the Japanese immigration to Brazil. So I spent all those years, r you know, researching a community there and talking to so many people. So the inspirations came from those stories and how to put them together and to weave. A, a, uh, a novel, a fictional tale based on this history. Um, so there's, it's always been a project, it's, and uh, it's been something that I'm interested in at the time. Um, and it moves around, and there'll be some, there'll be some seed of something in the project that I'm doing that I'll think about later. And I think this is what it is like for writers and artists. They'll, they'll find something that's really interesting to them in a project they're doing, and then they'll pursue it in a later um, rendition. Do you worry about cultural or collective forgetting, thinking about conversations regarding critical race theory, et cetera? Well, we've been forgotten. So I don't, you know, I feel that if we don't write our stories and we don't tell them and we don't uh, keep them, you will be forgotten. It's true, and um, and and erased. And uh, so, yeah, this that's why I do it. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a a difference between the way you think about erasure and and the way you think about forgetting? Yeah, there is a difference, but I can't think about it now. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Let's move on then. <laughs> Could you talk a bit about your view of culture and literature's relationship to politics? Have there been times when you've had to navigate tensions between your aesthetic project and political ones, like of the Asian American movement, et cetera? Yeah, um, it, it was difficult to do that pro the project on Asian American, you know, pro that movement, because, um, yeah, <laughs> there had been writing before, and um, I think the people who felt that they were involved deeply in, in that movement and uh, the, the, that activism, felt that they, it had not been, um, the story had been not been told uh, quite the way they remembered it, all right? Or that it had been theorized by academics in different, in a way that, that they were, did not appreciate. And so when I came around to say, oh, I'm, I'm gonna write a fiction, I'm gonna write a novel about you guys, and they go, oh, no, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, we're not telling you anything. They were, it was really, it was hard. And I spent a lot of time uh, trying to get 
buy-in for um, my project. And, you know, thankfully I had wonderful friends who, who really helped me along and said, think about this, I want you to meet this person, you need to think about this. Um, and I spent hours and hours trying to uh, learn. It took 10 years, it did. Um, and I'm very aware of that, those politics now. But then I also felt that we had to, we had to talk about it too. So maybe I outed some folks and, uh, uh, and, and maybe they're mad at me now. Nobody has ever said that. I mean, I, 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 I think you should say it and you should go say, well, that never happened. But no one said that. Yeah, of course. Hmm. So we're, we're almost out of time, but you did a lot of shout outs at the beginning. And I, we have a question wondering if there are any characters from Sansei and Sensibility short stories in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, my sister is definitely in it. <laughs> You know, she's a, she's Jane, and she's a Janeite. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking of y'all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, not in. Yeah, I I'd have to look at each story. Um, there is that story about um, the Tama Cafe. I rename it. And we know that that's kind of Atomic Nancy. Um, and that was fun to do. Yeah, just think about maybe that happened. A food fight, Atomic Cafe, I thought that was great. <laughs> so, you know, I made up a lot of stuff. You'll have to bake a lot of flan for that food fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Karen Teyamashita. Please join me in thanking her. It's been an honor, and I will turn things back over to Joy, possibly. <laughs> OK, we won't. <laughs> I hear footsteps. Here she is. I was watching from above. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I just, can we have one more round of applause for Karen Tayamashita? <laughs> and thank you so much as well to Jasmine and um, UCSC. We're so grateful for this partnership and for this event tonight. Um, it's been such an honor to be a partner and to be able to host this. So we hope that um, you all have a really safe and wonderful night. Um, we'll see some of you a bit later. Um, we also want to let you know that we are selling Sansei and Sensibility um, online from the Janum store. So we have some QR codes in the lobby if you want to scan those. Um, and you can either get the books sent to you or pick them up from the museum. Um, so we would love, of course, for you to grab a copy um, and continue to experience the amazing work of Karen Teyamashita. So with that, thank you so much, everyone, and have a really wonderful and safe night. Thank you.